Hey there, how are you? I'd like to make sure before the conference is over that we can connect the uh, uh, spot bar contact info. Sure, we did that lunch time. Okay. event. I'm the dean here. If you have any questions, um, want to chat about research, the school, I am hands-on and here and happy to do that. We have a really exciting day today, but before we begin, I just want to honor someone that's here with us today who changed the entire... Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. So, I know I don't need that. No. <laughs> I'm not a microphone person. Um, who's changed the entire landscape of how we talk about energy, psychology, energy medicine, and I'm just honored to know her and have her be in our presence, and that is Louise Hay. Louise, can you stand up, please? Allow the dialogue, especially in my field of psychology, to begin to change the entire landscape of how people in our regular, everyday culture talk. And I'm so honored that you're here, Louise, and it's a pleasure to know you. So, with that, I'm going to let Dr. Murphy introduce Dr. Gordon Sweeter and then talk to Good morning. Designed um, with Vastu in mind, 
and um, it's the um, very unique um, chairholder for human rights and peace studies with the United Nations. And the uh, director of this organization took me under his wing in 98, and since then has offered free labs, equipment, lights, phones, everything, so that we can get on and do our work. We also have another office in the more um, jungly part of India, where we deal with training courses and um, people at other institutes who want to get hold of the technology that we work with. So for me it's all about imaging. It's all about what we can see. Um, science has been under this spell for many years. Seeing is believing. But there are so many different ways of seeing something. This is an orange with a CT scan, MRI, and with the old-fashioned killing photography. But what are we saying here? We're saying that in modern medicine, in modern science, we look at what's physical and we try and peer inside it within boundaries that we have already pre-described and ascertained are physical. And so we've been quite blind for the last 72 years to this discovery. There are two, three thousand different um, designs of the Keelian device. Now what I find interesting is that this reminds me of something very important. Like, I'm a tree. I'm an orange tree, sucking the living daylights out of the sun. And I make a ball of light. And then some Adam comes along, or some Eve, and eats that light. And that's the sacred contract between a human being and nature. Human doings don't eat oranges. Human doings, like this rat, eat cornflakes and process food. This is a human being, someone that eats seeds and sprouts. Someone who has enough life force in them to think and to be, rather than just to do. And you could argue that modern medicine has been propped up by new technology. What I mean by propped up is that we all very well know in this room that the pharmaceutical um, industrial model of medicine is very limited. And yet, it's the norm. And the reason why, for the last 30 years, we've not been able to make much headway in changing that is because every few years, a new device came out which seemed to reinforce that physical, biochemical model of the human body. But if I ask you, at what price? At what price are we irradiating people with six, seven hundred x-rays in an executive health checkup? And now there is a new way, and my institute's been very um, involved, if you like, in looking at these new technologies and seeing whether legislation and regulation is limiting their application, on the one hand, we can do that kind of thing in India, but on the other hand, seeing and establishing a new criteria for community medicine. Community medicine is non-invasive. It's predictive. It means that we go to our community and pluck out the wonky weeds before they become diseased. And it allows us to, especially with daily wage earners, many of them in the world, it allows us to address issues that perhaps three months in a hospital they would never be able to recover from. So here we have an image of a medical thermal um, uh, image. Uh, this is showing diabetes two years before uh, there would be any symptoms. Um, in other words, with a simple device, infrared imaging, we are able to see, like a clown's red nose, a signal of the individual's health trajectory. And we're seeing this long before there are any symptoms, long before there would even be any uh, something tangible in the blood that we could, we could measure. So in other words, we're speaking very loudly about what trajectory we're on. And healing is about helping people steer away from disease into the open water. Now, with medical thermal imaging with breast cancer, you can see that... Um, oops. 
in two years, so there's 256 cells, the medical thermal camera will pick up a breast tumour. But it'll take eight years, and for the tumour to have grown 4.2 billion cells in size, before we can see it with a mammogram. And yet, we're being sold down the river that mammography is the right way to screen the breast. Now the reason why we use mammography is because of the industrial and medical racket. Um, otherwise, we'd be using this because it's totally non-invasive, it's harmless, and it beats mammography by six years, uh, not just in breast cancer, but in all the other issues. So I do find it very interesting that when we were at ICM a couple of years ago, I was listening to Beverly Rubik speaking, and she said, I consider medical thermal imaging a biofilm imaging device, something to that extent. And that really enthused me because we'd already got it out and started looking at it alongside all our other biofilm imaging devices. And that's what we've been doing for the last few years. This shows that process where the capillaries are taken over by the, uh, the cancer to draw more energy into the tumour, even though it's absolutely tiny. And so we can see this very unique pattern. Six years before the mammogram will spot it. These guys are from John Hopkins. It's expected that accurate imaging techniques for quantifying angiogenesis may provide prognostic information and help to direct therapy. Well, we've been doing that for what, 10, 20, 30, 40 years with medical thermal imaging? Come on, there's an elephant in the room here. Uh, the technology has developed so much that we can now overlay features of the individual or of human beings so we can really guide our practitioners exactly where issues are rooted. Pain may be in one place, but where it's rooted may be another. And in research terms, we're able to identify Changes in temperatures before and after healing sessions, before and after therapeutic interventions, and they say one degree difference is significant in studies. Now here you can see um, in a timeline where we introduce acupuncture needles into a very painful knee, and you can see just every five minutes how that pain dissipates out of the needles or somehow with the needles help and is reduced back to normal. People like Alex Gray have painted the biofield quite beautifully now. Um, before him we had to rely on gouches and old Indian paintings. But he did quite a good job of bringing together what I call the two sides of the glass. The monks who one went to India with the story of the chakras and the other who went to China with the story of the meridians to keep that sacred knowledge apart and perhaps it being brought together now by people like Alex Gray is significant. But it's not a fantasy. We have a number of research institutes around the world, including this one, which have got um, biofield multiplier, biophotonic multipliers and counters, which are measuring the biophotonic emissions from living systems. And for example, um, when biophotons leak out of the body, you can say someone's health is affected, we try to retain our biophotons in our body. But when a healer is transmitting healing, you can see a change in biophotonic emission transfer which is raised from 300 pulses a square centimeter second to 10,000. And that's from the palm of the hand. So we're talking Spider-Man here. You know, we have the ability to pour chi out of the palms of our hands. And in the same way, we have the ability to see the energy field. And I'm going to challenge you this morning to do just that. Because I'm sure you remember those 3D posters when you look at the dots and you're kind of like, oh, what is that? And eventually a dolphin comes out. And it comes out when you relax your eyes. You take your eyes out of focusing on someone. And you actually look as if you're looking at their energy field. So you just stop focusing. It's like door handles, curbs, pencils have taken our seeing and focused it. And that's why we're not so clairvoyant anymore. But if you just take that, switch that process off, you can use me as a case study. And just look at the glow around me and you'll be surprised that you can see it. Very easy to see the energy 
field, if you just look. As above, so below, the energy field of our planet is graded into different stratospheres and mesospheres and thermospheres in the same way our energy field has layers. Perhaps Keeling photography is imaging that innermost layer, the etheric layer. And we find with these old pictures of Keeling a very fabulous story of the difference between organic food on the right, nice wholemeal bread, shiny brightly, and the sort of processed crap we get in the supermarket. In the same way, if we store something for too long rather than eating it fresh, that life force leaks away. And we eat this stuff. We would not poo and pee if we did not eat light. We'd be like a train. You put coal in here and ash would come out. It's not like that. We suck light out of our food. That's what we do. And here, an apple that's been microwaved just for one minute. You can see how that biofield is depleted. And modern Keeling imaging gives us an insight into perhaps the layers or the subtle layers within that etheric field. Now, my institute has had a focus on what I call sort of bringing the line in the sand back in our favour. So instead of ambulance chasing, what medicals do at the moment and waiting for people to actually explode. I'm talking about a medicine where we predict and measure people's disease long before they have health issues. Okay? So how do we do that? Because with our imaging techniques, we can see them develop. And over thousands of scans, we've been able to see what the weather pattern of a different disease looks like. So for example, if we take a set of PIP imaging scans, this is polycontrast interference photography developed by Harry Oldfield, um, not been very well understood, not been very well studied, there's more papers being published about it. Interestingly, there's at least 10 other devices that use the same technique now. It's like X-ray was developed by Marconi, but now there's so many different companies that have taken this basic technique and enhanced it and improved it. But this is the original fellow oil field. And we can see digestive issues in the bottom part of this picture which show up as a kind of red pooling. So I can say to that guy, and this is something very important, when we're treating people, we need to open a channel of trust. So if the guy walks in and doesn't have to tell me his symptoms, and I can look at him and go bang, 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 channel of trust opens, we don't waste any time, treatment can begin. Healer and Healy interaction can begin. Here you can see when we take it out of focus, we can see the chakras. The brow chakra, the throat chakra, the heart chakra. You see that pooling over the heart chakra? We used to call that a blockage. We don't anymore. We call it shielding. But it's not for me to project on you that you're blocked. You may be shielding something that's in your environment that goes on for months and months and months. And just because you come in my clinic, my one room hotel, and I want to sign you up for weeks and weeks of treatment. I can't project on you that you're blocked or that you're leaking. We need to be educated about our language. People are shielding or they're venting. If they were venting, it means they're doing it because they know they're doing it. Someone's leaking, doesn't make them feel good. Heart chakra at the back, even more congested. This is an old story. This guy's getting some healing. In fact, that's exactly what was happening. Emotions, shielding here is going to affect our relationships. This is all about relationships. So you're going to have irritable bowel syndrome or digestive issues. Oops. So, the good thing about PIP, it allows us to really observe the healing exchange, whether it's, you know, with the healer's present or in a distance. You can actually see what's going on. You can see how they seem to generate a kind of white light. And from that white light, the Healy draws what they need. A healer doesn't project Panto 632 on people. He brings and creates an environment of white light, 
and the helium needs to draw from that. That's why there needs to be an interaction. And you can see with PIP the difference between healthy people, people with lung or heart issues, they just show up very clearly in the field. Someone who's a young meditator, very bright crown chakra, white light, nice symmetrical chakras, lady on the right, a couple of years, so a couple of weeks before death, very severe throat cancer. All of her chakras depleted and um, uh, shielded, souls locked in for a flight. This is how congested it can get, or how shielded it can get, let's say. So we've got a lot of pooling, goes all the way to black, and then someone meditating gives you a real idea of the, the brightness and colour banding we can see with BO5. This is in a laboratory condition, same lab, every picture taken. And then of course into, into interesting images, say when we see someone who's had an amputation, and we can see the phantom limb in the same way with a Kirlian photograph, you can see the phantom leaf. Well that was 72 years ago, we've advanced since then, so I've done a lot of work with Indian Army and measuring about one in a hundred, you'll see a phantom limb, and you can coax them out like a snail with lettuce. Um, here we've done a lot of research with, say, mannequins. This is a healer in um, Taiwan or Korea somewhere, and you can see how just by standing in the presence of their field, the healer would be able to have access to this white light which of course just standing there on their own, they don't. And when we image someone and a big spider walks along the wall, we see the field of the spider, that's the top left. This is a sacred seed called the Rudraksh, and it has a natural hole through it, so they thread them into a necklace, and they don't die. You could pierce a seed, but these have a natural hole, so the sadhus wear these sort of rainbow, shiny shields of light, and a crystal and a book with an omel in it, which had a very interesting violet field. And there's those Rudrax again in a different filter. You can see the field, how it all joins up. Quite interesting. Now this technology obviously works with a video camera, a telescope and a microscope. So we can look through our microscope with the type of filters we're using with the um, full system. And we can see bacteria now. We don't have to stain them and kill them. These guys are moving like a wave. They attack. The ones in the front have got chemical crash helmets on, and they are attacking. And when they're tired, they pass the crash helmets back and go and have a rest. I mean, this is how bacteria are working, you know, in your little puddle on the ground. Now, again, technology is developed even from PIP. I'm working with a gentleman in Thailand who's a gaming guru of technology, and he's the original PIP program and he's now made it 3D. So without any doubt, we can see the bulges, we can see the, the dents in the field, and we can see the layers very clearly. This is obviously just a hand. Um, in order to calibrate our research at um, uh, Center for Biofield Sciences, we work with um, the GDV and another, a number of other devices. So we have all the devices that are standard biofield imaging techniques side by side, and it's helped us root out the Mickey Mouse ones, because if they don't have repeatability or they don't show what you're expecting to see from the same person, you know it's just some little computer generating an image. But obviously GDV gives uh, a biogram, if you like, so it's a, a, a little stencil of a human being, and it cuts the, the, the fingers down and projects the field around. It's one of those devices which has a lot of data, but kind of shows you what you want to see, whereas PIP is a real, separate imaging technique. And of course, with Karotkov's work and his team, he's been able to extrapolate a lot of data from this, and so it's become one of the standards in the research community. The new paints allow better use by clinicians. Um, this kind of thing I don't think is very helpful, but um, it does provide a lot of useful data. But seeing chakras like that, the sort of concept of traffic lights, reinforcing that, I don't think that's useful right now. Um, here's an interesting slide one experiment is sending love to another, captured on the GDV, and the actual love looks like a heart <laughs> on the left-hand image. Um, Karakov's quite productive. This is a new device he's developed. We call it the Sputnik. I've used this in a lot of temples, a lot of ceremonies. We send it out all over India now. It's very popular, and you can measure 
the change of the sort of room or space energy. Um, I think this is an experiment with um, a pearl or um, reconnection healing, and you can see how the energy in the room changes at different times in the whole process. I'm a big fan of Valerie Hunt. Um, she's definitely a victim of uh, the sort of medical establishment not supporting uh, our type of research. She developed this incredible camera with some very unique features and hasn't been able to recreate it since the digital age. And this was something developed at, in California at UCLA, um, very analog machinery. And um, you can see here in the next image how clearly it shows someone in a meditative state much brighter someone eating junk food, it's really dull. Um, on the beach, you can really get a sense of the field, but we really don't have access to this camera. Um, I'm looking forward, apparently there are some advances. I hope that even old friends of hers yes. can help her in these last few stages. Yes. But we need technology like that. Um, we can rely on other techniques, obviously in our research, we bring in um, clairvoyants who may draw cases and then we can look at them and see if they corroborate. Um, there's a lot of information out there in esoteric literature. There's over 130 different references to the biofield, culturally. So we can find the brow chakra in 130 different languages. It's not like some guy in, in Germany or India thought this up and we've all been following the same script. It really isn't like that. With resonant field imaging, we get very uh, inexpensive access to measuring the biofield. I think it's just about $1,000. Um, PIP obviously is my favorite um, because it allows us to see things like the chakras in great detail. Um, it's about four and a half, five thousand dollars $5,000, so we're not talking silly CAT scan money here. And of course, it's like turning the lights on in the operating theater. Um, I recently wrote a chapter for a book, and we were looking at the dimensionality. And how I was describing it is the base chakra is the chakra which locks us into the up and down, the vertical axis. It's like a magnet, you know, tracking the human beings. Um, and this chakra, the navel chakra, deals with relationships, as you know, and space around you. So it's the horizontal axis. And the um, third chakra allows us the, the third dimension of space. So our three lower chakras allow us to exist in this space. The, the beat of time is introduced by the heartbeat to us. We get time through the heartbeat. So space and time are dealt with up to here. So when we're looking at things like distant healing, which occur beyond space and time, we realize we've got other gears perhaps we've never consciously used, certainly not well documented in modern science, where we can operate. That's what we're discovering right now. How interesting that is. So here you can see a PIP with someone, um, you've got shielding on the heart center, and always, we often, well, always, often, we can often see that solar plexus compensating. So one energy center will help try and bring energy into another by opening wider and kind of trying to kind of compensate. Um, it's a very dynamic system. So each chakra works as a team, um, managing the range of the spectrum on each dimension, but then each chakra is the core, like on a balloon, knot on each dimension. And with PIP, as you can see, it allows us to get some insight into what's going on. Um, in this case, for example, similar to that fellow earlier, we've got someone with a lot of cooling and shielding in their navel region. So this is emotional. Left side of their body, that means it's... This is where the healer comes in and the doctor falls away. Because I know that there's no point giving this lady irritable bowel medicine. She needs to call her daughter. It's obvious. It's obvious because it's an emotional issue on the female in the family. She's holding it very close. And when you hit the nail on the head and you know that you find out they've been estranged and it's all about that. That's why devices like this are very useful. I was lucky enough, um, like it seems like decades ago, to make a film with Arthur C. Clarke called The Colors of Infinity. And um, it was a film about chaos theory and chaos mathematics fractals. 
and we interviewed a lot of scientists, um, people like Stephen Hawking, and they were proposing, because fractals had only just been discovered when we made this film, what types of things we might get from this new understanding of geometry. And certainly I realised very early on that the fractal vortex like this, where you can effectively dive forever into this vortex, is exactly the same mathematics as the chakra. You know, how do I fit infinity in a finite space? You know, I'm a boy bag with my spacesuit for Earth, legs to move around, hands to bring food to my face, mouth to eat, eyes to see. This is a boy bag designed to navigate like a spaceman on the moon. But what else is going on? The infinite me looks a bit more like that. And it's interesting because when we take modern scientific procedures, simple procedures like uh, using the functional MRI, this is some work by one of our colleagues, um, Joey, 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 Joey Jones. Jones. Yeah, Jones. And um, here you can see by stimulating the vision point, I shine a light in your eye. You expect that the area in the brain to light up. That's what it looks like on a functional MRI. But I don't expect to stick a needle in your vision point of your toe in exactly the same area to light up. Especially I don't expect it to light up faster. What that means is that, a bit like the difference between broadband and wiring in our house, the meridian system is a fiber optic superhighway, super fast, unlike the nervous system, which is the old copper wiring with a synapses, so somehow you can switch on the switch and then almost watch it ping, you can always watch the light bulb go on. That's a bit like thinking, as opposed to leaping out of the way when uh, Sven Gorgi is watching a cat. Like I said, it happens even faster by needling the vision point. So we now know the meridians and chakras are real. We can image the acupoints now with a new device from Russia called AccuVision 4. It allows us to illuminate the points. You can see whether they're dull or bright and therefore whether they need unblocking. We're shining our etheric exhaust. Our biofield is our etheric dross. If we don't have any dross, it's very bright. If we're full of shit, so is our field. With, we shine out our stuff. Sometimes it gets so blocked we need to unblock it. There's soot in it. And the uh, etheric soot and the uh, uh, acupuncturist is clearing it, like sticking his finger down your exhaust pipe. But you have thousands of them. And so we understand that the meridians and the images we're seeing and taking are the same. So when we take an ultrasound scanning acoustic microscope of an acupuncture point, we see it's that same kind of vortex as the chakra. And really exciting, I have to say, for the last few years I've been going on and on and on about this. Um, some work done in North Korea by um, a very exciting scientist um, called Bong Han, um, working with quite limited resources, now being repeated in South Korea, um, imaging these fiber optic strands discovered in the body. They're only working with small creatures at the moment, but this is an electron microscope of what we think may be a meridian. It's like a fiber optic strand, it has material inside it. Um, this is a blood capillary, and the pipette is grabbing one. Do you see how tiny they really are? and why perhaps the last couple of hundred years of chopping up dead bodies we've missed them because they really are tiny you need to stain them you need to do all kinds of things to really see them clearly but once you've worked out what you're looking for you can go into tissue and identify one because they're quite strong and I think what they're doing is bringing light from the, um, the, the, the outside into the dark recesses of the body bringing light into the body these channels that's what I think they're doing. And you can see here when we stain them, quite sophisticated equipment and stains are used, we see this spider's web, this human matrix, this living matrix. Oh, we've had it before. So when we look at the microscope with blood, we can now see when we first withdraw red blood cells from the finger, each one has a very vibrant field, but as we introduce the soil bacteria, they finally die. So we now have a new 
blood test where we can tell the vibrancy of someone. Can they handle this operation or do they need some more chi? That kind of understanding is possible. Now I'm going to jump that slide and come back to it in a minute. Um, with some of our technologies, we get rare moments when things don't quite come out as we might imagine they would. Um, this is a lady on the left who was a Kundalini yogi and she could disappear. So she came to our institute and we took some images of her. And the second one down really is a very interesting one because that's when she was no longer visible in the room. That was what she, that's what we could see in the PIP and I've never ever seen it in my life. I lived before or since. On the right, we've got two young boys, my right, your left, um, who have spent their whole lives in a temple. Never worn shoes, never got in a car. When we first took this picture, my colleagues were like, oh God, there's something wrong with the computer. And they actually herded the guys out of the room. And then they had to herd them out of the building. And we realized that it was their field, it was so bright, uh, just because they'd been meditating and reading uh, mantra across them, that, um, you know, they pulled us. Um, Harry Oldfield, just a couple of years ago, developed this new filter and it's called the Oldfield filter. And you put it on the front of a digital camera, so it's very accessible. And it allows you to take images of entities or spirits, for example. These are two guys doing a seance with an old friend who used to do the seance with them before. And she died some weeks before this. And they knew she was still there, so they invited us in. And sure enough, we could see her quite clearly wearing her favorite red and white t-shirt. The pictures on the top, this is a, a better blown up version, you can see that lady in the house in England actually sort of pushing away, saying, stand back. Um, this is a total uh, spirit entity, and I think it's important that we're now developing equipment sensitive enough to measure entities and the type of etheric zoology that's out there. Um, these are some pictures which Jack Stuckey gave to me some time ago. A small story I'd like to share about them. For some reason, I said this woman um, received a new heart. And I was giving it in lectures, and one of my colleagues said, you just can't say that, you don't know that. And I said, no, I really do know that. And then a colleague of mine and I were speaking just yesterday about the, the picture, and they said, yes, that lady did have a heart transplant, because she'd been, um, um, he'd been speaking with Jack Stuckey about a particular set of pictures, and this is them. So this is a very interesting process. Um, a machine was developed called the Luminator. There's not very many of them. There's about six or seven of them in the world. I've had the great opportunity of playing around with a few of them. And what it basically does is it sort of shakes up the spooks in you. So if you're creating sort of a nice front, normally, stand in front of the Luminator and you just can't hide. Um, and many people will take a picture and you won't see any difference at all. You really won't. But in this case, we really do have quite a dramatic change. So this is the original picture enlarged, the Polaroid picture taken with the illuminator switched on. And, sorry, the illuminator not switched on. And now the illuminator switched on. Look in the background, sorry. See the pictures, just a little bit blurry, that's all. Pictures look like they've just gone chin chin. But look at her, suddenly, very clearly, we're seeing an African-American woman in her face. That's obvious. See that again? And maybe some other action a little bit further down no. in the script. So this is someone who's had a heart transplant of an African-American woman. Yeah, you can see the arch split going down. Yeah, well, you can see all kinds of things. Yeah. But anyway, I just thought that it's important for us to have a look at perhaps what is now the leading edge and, and, and give people some idea and some forewarning. Um, you know, one of the problems we have by not having integration in medicine is that we as healers can't do the kind of energetic work that we need to do at the clinical environment. We're locked out in many cases. And so they, they sterilize all the green cotton and the um, stainless steel. But many times our concern perhaps is that when a lady's lying there in the stirrups and she's just had a difficult birth and the child is being attended to, she looks a little bit like an empty shell on the beach to a hermit crab. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, she's got this great big warm empty space which has recently been vacated by a smaller creature that needed a bigger home, just like the hermit crab. And it may well be that what we're seeing we say things like postnatal depression, sudden changes in diet, is actually some poor fellow who died on a motorcycle accident zooming around the room, not quite ready to let go, sees this fabulous um, uh, shell on the beach and dives in. And so we're misdiagnosing things like a possession or entities entering the, the, the womb after birth as, say, postnatal depression. I think that's a real issue. And the integration of medicines is going to solve that type of problem. Now, if you can indulge me, because I did start a little bit late, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about distant healing and show you. Well, this study was done before my institute had its makeover. And it was a lot to do with challenges of uh, mentors such as Beverly and um, Claude saying to me, you know, stop playing around with the, the dynamics of this and start publishing some material and start getting stuff out there. And in these days, you know, we were really just quite happy looking at the changes. I mean, this is a distant healing study. Um, a fellow called Taimi. So he's sitting in his room in um, Colorado, in Boulder, Colorado. And all of our case studies are in our lab under very strict conditions in India. So, the other side of the world. And what we were so amazed at, not just, because we had him on the phone, making sure that he was starting at the same time, and obviously the patient didn't know that. But if you, if you, if you compare the data for the phone call, and when this, these effects started happening, it was really instantaneous and impressive. So the other thing I'd say about this fellow, which really surprised me, was that I was doing all the, diagnosis is an interesting word. Di means to, ag means not, gnosis means no. Diagnosis means two people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I got, you don't know what I got. Talk about diagnosis, but my assessment of this fellow was well documented and well written down in all of these cases. But what we didn't realize was that he was doing it as well. In Colorado, he only had their name, and he was doing a full assessment and diagnosis of the patient as if he was standing in front of them, as well as affecting and treating them quite impressively. And of course, as I told you before, we don't just rely on one technology to do this kind of work. We will test each patient with four or five or six different machines. So that's PIP, that's GDB, and even with the thermal imaging, in this case, you can see the patients were having considerable improvements just after one session. That was just a private study. Um, I'm glad to say we've kind of updated our techniques. I mean, I'm landing right in the middle of the paper. I need to respect the time. But what we're doing now is we're taking the pixels, the uh, colors we feel are in the wrong place, or lower frequency than they could be in that area. So for example, red. People have a lot of red pixels in their field. We want to see that coming down, because to us, red is pooling, it's shielding, it's sluggish energy. So in studies, we always want to see it coming down, and consequently, we like to see the other colors going up. Um, this gives us data, a bit more like the GDV that Pip was, has, has, was lacking for so long. Now, I also want to go to this slide here, yeah. So this is a study we did for a, a San Diego-based company that made patches. And what was interesting here, you can see the three bars are of great significance, the data is of great significance. So in our study group, of you know, 100 patients, uh, including control and placebo, we were getting significant results on every single device we were using, every single measure. And brilliantly, no results, nothing significant with the placebo. So we've now aligned our way of doing things with the standard practice. So that's now allowed us to get quite a lot of work published and hopefully we'll access those channels. Although I personally believe the phoenix needs to rise out of the fire not out of a concrete hospital. So I'm done. Um, I'd just like to say that I did bring my slideshow copied onto CDs. Um, I'd certainly appreciate if you could give my colleague $20 for one.
uh, that will help um, uh, sustain our clinic, which is run by donations only. We've had, I think, over 25,000 people through the doors, so it's money well spent. And if you want to give us a bit more, we're most welcome. Uh, no receipts, apparently. Uh, but otherwise. <laughs>